And so we're in this series, All in Wonder. It's a, it's a real short kind of Christmas type series, but um, really what it's bringing out is just the sense that in this season, uh, a lot of times we're fighting to remember um, Jesus as a central component, peace, uh, reason for the season, if you will. Um, in fact, in a little bit, we're going to talk about the actual real reason for the season. But this whole thing and idea of awe and wonder uh, comes from the thought that what if Christmas and what if our our attempts to remember the centrality of Jesus during this season um, wasn't just a seasonal struggle. What if it was actually indicative of a lot bigger problem that we have, and specifically that we don't often sit in awe and wonder of God? In other words, the bigness of God, the glory of God, the greatness of God, the grandeur of God, they're things that after a while, kind of become familiar with us. They become very normal to us, and because of that, they kind of lose their sense of awe, their sense of wonder. Perhaps you've heard this concept before, that familiarity, familiarity breeds contempt. The more familiar you are with something, the more familiar I am with something, it tends to have this diminishing effect on the respect and reverence we have towards something. Um, I learned this really early on. I uh, So... There was this thing that they don't have anymore called a latchkey kid, okay? Which just basically meant that you just did whatever, whenever, wherever, and you just were home by the time that the you know, sun went down most times. But if you weren't, you know, it really wasn't that big of a deal either. You just kind of had to be home by dinner, and you were always guesstimating that because we didn't have, you know, phones. We didn't, I mean, you're not going to believe this. We didn't even have pagers. Whew, I know. <clears throat> Some of you guys like prayer requests for your parents. So... What happened was my grandma actually lived next door to us. So growing up, my parents weren't, went home, and I have you know, kind of a, a background of history with parents with a, you know, a mom with alcoholism and a dad who worked a lot, and they were both kind of you know, gone a good amount of the time. Um, so my grandma, who lived next door to us, would oftentimes look after us in the afternoon. She'd make sure we have a snack before we went out and played. She would try to make sure we do homework, but I would oftentimes push against that, as you can imagine. And so what would happen over time is my grandma, who I think was incredible, I mean, she was phenomenal. Graduated from um, Texas College for Women uh, in Denton, Texas in, the, I think, the 30s or something like that, late 20s, um, early 30s. Uh, she was in the Marine Corps, served in a number of different areas, a number of different places where she met my grandfather. Um, my grandma was awesome, and she was kind of the rock of our family. But over time... Having been raised in a family that was kind of militaristic, or not militaristic, but it was a military. So it was very much a chain of commandment. It was very much a yes, sir, no, sir. When my dad yelled, hey, Ben, it wasn't a what, it was a sir. Anybody else in that family? Okay, the rest of you guys are very disrespectful. I want you to know that. Your floor for, you know. Anyways, um, and I'm very thankful for that, honestly. I mean, the, the, the level to which my parents instilled those types of things in me, it has made a, a huge difference because when you show respect, it just it adds value to the person across from you. Different sermon, different day. But we'll say this. Over time, I got really good at manners with everybody but my grandma and my parents. And I remember I was talking to my grandma and, and, you know, typical, I was probably like 11 and being like wildly disrespectful and I knew everything because, you know, I'm double digits now, grandma, you know, like I filled up both hands and I'm working on a toe right now, right? So I'm feeling pretty good and pretty big about myself and I remember I was just being wildly disrespectful to the point where I wasn't, my grandma wasn't keeping me, I would go to after school because I would be so kind of, you know, pushed back and rebellious. I remember my dad having a conversation with me that basically went, Ben, why is it Why is it that you are respectful to everybody else's parents? I mean, we hear it from class. We hear it from, like, our friends. And when you go over to their houses, and you're always, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. But but the people that you're close to, why is it that you don't do that with the people who you're closest with? And my answer was simple, because I don't have to, because they're close to me. And I think that idea, which he obviously was not happy with that answer, by the way, But I think that idea kind of captures for many of us the idea of God and the idea of awe and wonder. It's the sense that we have access to God through Jesus. And so because we have that access, because we have his word, we just kind of forget that that's a big deal. We forget that we shouldn't. And so we then look at Old Testament texts and project into them a lack of fairness of God, not realizing we're not currently getting what's fair. We're getting what's called grace. If you weren't here last week, we looked at this uh, Old Testament text in Exodus where 
God had just delivered the nation of Israel out of Egyptian uh, slavery. And as they're walking around, he says, okay, I'm about to meet with Moses, but Moses, I want you to command the people. Nobody even touch the side of this mountain while we're meeting together. If anybody touches it, they're going to die. If anybody even touches the base of the mountain, they're going to die. And if they touch the base of the mountain, don't try to save them. Just shoot them, and it'll be easier for everybody, which we would look at and say, that is really harsh. But that is what happens when the sinfulness of man comes in encounter with the holiness of God is that none of us should be left standing, and the only reason that we do and that we have is because of Jesus. And the reason I say this, and the reason I think this is indicative of more than just like the Christmas season, it's this. Have you ever felt, have you ever felt like you should feel more when you think about the gospel? Have you ever felt like it just kind of normalizes? It just kind of feels like it's it. I know I'm a sinner. Jesus died for me, and I can have a relationship with him. I have salvation through him, right? But it's not like this, like, grabbing thing. It's not like this emotional thing. It's not like this thing that you're overwhelmed by or I'm overwhelmed by. It just becomes a thing. And my guess is the same principle that's at play that makes it difficult to look at the centrality of Jesus in the Christmas season is the same thing that kept, that that when we have our relationship with God doesn't seem that impactful when we think about salvation. And it's just simply the idea that we're very familiar with God, and so we lose a sense of awe and wonder and respect because he is personal, but he is also incredibly holy. And so what we're going to look at today specifically, if last week was more towards the holiness of God, we're going to look at today, which I know is going to be everybody's favorite subject, which is the sinfulness of of us. And let me tell you why I do that. Because the idea of grace is only as deep as the idea of sin. The idea of grace, in other words, the idea that God has not only not not made me face the, the consequences and not just forgiven me, but actually gifted me on top of that. That's grace. Not that just we're just forgiven, but that we're actually given a gift in spite of our rebellion. And the gift that we get is only as substantive as the level to which we understand that we are sinful. I was talking to a guy this week, having a great conversation, and we were talking about this kind of central idea. What I was saying is, man, for me, whenever I feel like the gospel is not impactful, it's one of two things. I either undervalue the holiness of God or overvalue my personal sinfulness. As in, I overvalue my personal holiness and think I'm not that sinful. Either I'm not that sinful or he's not that holy or probably both. And so if last week was God is holy, this week is worse sinful. But don't worry. I know some of you are like, dude, this is like the worst Sunday I could have invited my friend to. Don't worry. This is not one of those types of sermons. In fact, I'm going to explain this at the end. But this is actually a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing and a beautiful picture that we get to partake in. So we're going to, we're going to lead off in the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 14. We read this last week. We're going to kind of also do, by the way, an Old Testament overview. I hope that's okay with you. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, In the Word, that being, being God, that being the Logos, that being something that John would use to leverage that their culture identified and understood as God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that's the Christmas story. And we, John would say, have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father. And then it's like he pauses and says, now how would I describe the glory of God? What would I use to say, this is the best two-word contrasting sentence and statement that I can give. He says it's full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Full of the reality that God is both holy, I'm not, and we are still forgiven. In light of it. Some of you are are grace people, meaning that you love grace. And you're you're like me, where we just kind of live in a world of gray, right? Like there's kind of there's wrong and there's right, and then there's like most of life, right? And some of you are like, no, we're truth. Everything is black, everything is white, it's either right or it's wrong. And I'm like, you're probably right, but I just have a difficult time telling sometimes, right? And so there's two kind of aisles or groups of people when it comes to this idea. But when it comes to God, all of us fall so incredibly short. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Old Testament. So we're just going to go through some ideas 
And I want to show you the amount of grace that God had simply in sending Jesus to the people in the nation of Israel. So I think that kind of, for me, explodes this idea and these parameters. So way back in the day, um, the garden, uh, you've got Adam, you've got Eve. They got this tree. They eat of the fruit of the tree. We're actually going to do somewhat of a series on this in the spring. And God said, this is the one only you know, place that you can't eat from. It's this one particular tree. And they obviously thought, hmm, that looks tasty, right? And so they saw this tree. The serpent kind of tempted them. There were some things that were going on. They ate of this tree. And from that point forward, God said that you are going to face the consequence of your disobedience and your rebellion. And so they did. So they were kind of kicked out, but God said at the beginning of that point, actually before he said this is the consequence, he said, I have a plan. I have a redemptive plan. I have a redemptive purpose for you, for this people. And so they kind of began to populate, and the nation began to grow, or the people began to grow. And as these people began to grow, God picked out this one particular family. It started with this guy, Abraham. Now, Abraham in his family, if you're thinking about this, a lot of times we think about like the heroes of faith of the Old Testament. You think your family is dysfunctional. You should meet Abraham's family. So Abraham goes and he has um, some kids. Well, actually, before he has kids, Abraham goes and he doesn't have kids. And God's called him to go to a particular place. And as God calls him to go to a particular place, Mm -hmm. um, he's wandering around. And God says, I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you a nation. And Abraham says, what nation, God? I'm getting old. My wife's getting old. There's nobody else around us. So God does this. If you've got your Bible, Genesis chapter 15, it's a super interesting thing that happens. So after these things, now Abraham, or Abram at the time, had just run into a version of Jesus in the Old Testament. So after these things, chapter 15, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield, your reward. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. In other words, God, it's cool that you want to give me something. It's cool that you want to do something through me and and that you're going to give me this inheritance, but I have nobody to pass it down to. And for them, that was a massive deal. So he says, there's a problem here with this promise, and the problem with the promise is I have no people. God said, I've got a solution for that. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look towards heaven and the number of the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he, being Abram, believed the Lord, and he counted to him as righteousness. It's the beginning of this idea, not the beginning, but kind of the the first really explicitly stated way that we have goodness with God, not because of what we do, but because we actually just believe God. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, the Chaldeans. To give you this land to possess. But he said, oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, and a partridge in a pear tree, because it's Christmas time, right? And he brought him all these things, cut them in half, and laid each of the half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And I know some of you guys are wondering, like, bro, what are we talking about right now, right? We were just talking about this, uh, this awe, maybe, and this wonder, and this Jesus, and now all of a sudden we're cutting animals in half. Here was what was incredible about what was to happen. For the first time ever, in a very tangible way, this was a covenant-cutting ceremony. So we hear that, and we think, I don't even know what that means. For them, they heard that, and they would have said, God is about to cut a covenant with people? Covenants back in the day worked in such a way that there would be a covenantal relationship, and that simply meant that there was oftentimes kind of a lesser party and a greater party, and it was a a contract in which almost every time the lesser party would pay taxes to the greater party, the greater party would provide um, protection and provision for the lesser party. And so God says, I am about to cut a covenant with a person. And to this point, Abram has done nothing significant or substantive except for simply believing God. And so God does this covenant. It says, we're picking up at verse 17. 
When the sun had gone down, it was, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Now, what's interesting about the covenant ceremony is that they would cut these animals in half. They would lay them on either side, and both parties would walk through. And the symbolism of this ceremony was as they walked through, they would acknowledge, if either of us are unfaithful to this covenant, may what happened to these animals happen to us. If I am unfaithful, may I die. So Abram has this vision. Here's this word from God. Cuts these things open. And as he's looking, he falls into this deep sleep and he sees this, this fire pot, smoking fire pot and this you know, flaming torch. Now, these were some of the first representations of how God would represent himself in the Old Testament. You think a few generations later, God, they're wandering through the desert, and God is leading the people through a cloud by day and a, and a pillar of fire by night. Here's what just happened in these verses. God singularly walks through this covenant as if to say, this covenant, though you did not walk through, I walk through, so this covenant is contingent on my faithfulness, not yours. In fact, if you're unfaithful, may I die. That when God started with Abraham, he said, Abraham, I know you're not going to be faithful. I know that you're not going to continually be obedient, and I want you to know that I am the one whose faithfulness this covenant rests on, and if either of us are unfaithful in this covenant, Abraham, you, that's why you're not walking through it, may I die because of it. And you know what happened? That exact thing. So this Abraham began to have a family. He eventually um, gave birth to a, a son and it will kind of a illegitimate son a little bit at first. And then a son's son that God said this is the promised son. And that son would have kids. And those kids would have all kinds of inner tension. And those kids, one of the kids um, would basically start the 12 tribes of Israel, which we think, okay, this is like the good people. Now, let me just say this. If you're making up a religion, you don't paint your founders in a bad light. He painted them in a horrible light. In essence, I'm going to have some, some kids with this wife. Now I'm going to have some kids with that wife. But that wife is jealous of that wife, and that wife is jealous of that wife, and I don't know if I'm going to have any kids anymore, so I'm going to give you my servant to have some more kids with, and I'm going to give you my servant to have more kids with. And there was this, this baby off between multiple wives, concubines, and these children that just began to populate. And then the guy goes thinking like, oh, that's the foundation of our faith. Yes. It was a mess. These sons, you can tell, were not like, big fans of each other, as they sold one of them off into slavery. Just so happened to be that that slavery that they sold him into would, would eventually someday land this guy named Joseph in Egypt. As Joseph was in Egypt, he would become over all of Egypt, and the family would move to Egypt. And they thought, okay, maybe this is the track that God's got us on. But they would be disobedient in Egypt. The, the nation of Egypt would forget about them, about Joseph, and they became enslaved. All of a sudden, these Hebrew people that were a small family began to populate everywhere and everywhere and everywhere. And so Pharaoh would over and over, he would oppress them and oppress them and oppress them. And my guess is they began to continue to multiply because, like, if work is really tough and you go home and you're like, what else have we got to do, right? And so they just all of a sudden started spreading. They started growing like wildfire to the point where they started to oppress them more and more. And the, the Hebrew people who were becoming the nation of Israel would pray to God, deliver us, deliver us, deliver us. So God eventually raised up Moses. Moses would deliver the people. So out of Egyptian slavery, a number of plagues happened. They walk into the desert. And in a matter of a few weeks, God had given them the Ten Commandments and led them to the Promised Land. You know what happened when they got to the promised land? They were like, God, you're so good. We saw how you overcame Egypt. They look and saw the people in the promised land and say, God, they are so big, there's no way we're going to defeat them. I feel like God would be like, bro, do y'all remember Egypt? Like Pharaoh, the most powerful person on the planet. But the nation of Israel, even though they had seen God's faithfulness just a few weeks before, had now turned from trusting God. And God said, you're going to wander the desert for 40 years. So they did. Everybody except for Joshua and Caleb. 
And eventually, about 40 years later, after much, much of the nation had died off, they went into the promised land. And they began to defeat people. And they began to take the place that, that God had called them to take. And as a part of this, they kept getting themselves in trouble. God said, I, want, I don't want you to have a king like everybody else has a king. I want to be your king, and I want you to be my people. They said, awesome, until they decided they just wanted to do their own thing for a while. And they would rebel against God, and then they'd pray, and they'd say, God, where are you? We're in trouble. And God would raise up a leader, and he would deliver them. And they'd do the same thing, and they'd say, God, where are you? We're in trouble. And he'd raise up a leader, and they'd do the same thing. And they'd say, God, where are you? We're in trouble. And 12 different times, the nation of Israel would have these judges that were raised up. And as the judges were raised up, they would deliver them back out, some major, some minor judges. But a number of judges would come through this process, which, by the way, we should all probably pause and acknowledge the fact that that's a lot of what we do in our relationship with God. God, I know I've done my own thing, God, but would you help me? Would you please intervene somehow? And sometimes God does. We say, thank you. And then a couple weeks later, go right back to the same pattern. Well, eventually, this rebellious nation said, God, we don't want you to be our king. We want our own king like every other nation. God said, okay, I'll give you a king, but I'm telling you, it's not going to go well. So after they had, they had basically you know, had this weird baby off recap, they had been enslaved in Egypt. They had rebelled in the desert. They had continually not trusted God in the desert. They had walked into this place. They had continually rebelled against God, raised up judges, rebelled against God, raised up judges. All of a sudden, they said, we want a king. God said, it's not going to go well, but if you want a king, I'll give you a king. So they got a king. First, a guy named Saul. Eh, not really a good king. Then David. David was the man. David killed it, right? David was, well, mm, David <laughs> was an adulterer. He saw this chick Bathsheba, and he was like, yo, what's her, what's her Insta handle, right? What's her Snapchat name? I don't know what the Snapchat thing is, right? So he gets with Bathsheba, knocks Bathsheba. Now, this is, by the way, the greatest king in the history of the nation of Israel, right? This is the man after God's own heart. This is like, this is what we're dealing with here, people, right? So he sees Bathsheba, knocks Bathsheba up. She gets pregnant, says this is going to be a problem, brings her husband home out of war. After bringing her husband home out of war, her husband is so single-mindedly, um, ha has his fidelity towards God and the people of God that he won't even go home to be with his wife. So he said, as long as my men are out there fighting, I will not be with her. Because David brought him home so we could sleep with his wife, so we could say it was his baby. The great king David. And when he doesn't do it, he sends, he sends the soldier back to the front lines with a letter to the commanding officer to say... At the biggest part of battle, I want you to send him to the front lines, and I want you to pull everybody else back so that he dies. He doesn't know he's carrying his own suicide note or his own death note. So he walks into that. And David, who's the king, has a son Solomon. Solomon, who is the wisest man in the world, who in spite of all of his wisdom... So out of all of the incredible, insightful Proverbs, Ecclesiastes that we read, Solomon had wisdom, but there's a huge difference between having wisdom and applying wisdom. He had wisdom. He didn't always apply the wisdom. And because of that, he got led towards other God. The nation split into two different nations, a northern tribe and a southern tribe. And both of those tribes, by the way, would rebel all the time. Northern tribe, more so than the southern tribe, but they would have kings that would consistently lead people away, kings that would consistently go after these other gods, these other groups of people. And so you've got this wayward nation, this messed up set of judges, this you know, very, very, very uh, lackluster kingship that happens. And so God sends these prophets to say, you guys got to stop it. You guys got to stop it. You guys got to stop it. And you've read the prophets probably, and what you have read when you read the prophets is it's a lot of like doom and gloom. And so we read that and we think, God... That is such an aggressive tone in the Old Testament. God's like, because I'm serious. I'm telling you, if you don't stop, I will put you in time out. It's like that you know, kid at the mall during Christmas time, which, one, nobody goes to the mall anymore, and two, kids at the mall, that's, that, there's like a special department in hell for that, right? 
But <laughs> one person's like, ha, that's my kid. Anyways, <clears throat> but what happens in this context is God's saying, I'm serious. I'm serious. Like any parent who you see their kid continually acting up, at some point it's like, yo, if you don't start acting right, I am going to lay the hammer. I am going to enforce a consequence. I am going to put you in time out. Don't touch the stove again. I'm telling you, you're going to get burnt. And so he says over and over, prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, because they would continually rebel and rebel and rebel and rebel. And in the middle of all of that rebellion, he takes this one nation and he wipes out all of in the Assyria in the northern kingdom. Kingdom. On the world's superpower, on the world's stage, the Assyrians get taken out by the Babylonians. The Babylonians, a number of years later, come out and take out the entire southern kingdom. So the entire nations of the people of God, after having been rebellious for year after years after years, for about 70 years, were in exile. Now, I want you to imagine that you were born in exile, and all you've heard about, all you know about, is how continually your forefathers went the wrong direction, and finally you're living in the consequence of that. And after about 70 years, God says, yes, you can go back. Yes, you can go back. So they go back. First a little bit, then a few more. They start to build the temple. They start to build around the temple some walls through the guy Nehemiah. And I think the idea for God was, I'm going to discipline you, but not because I don't like you. It's because I actually love you. I want you to do what's right. And after a number of years of being back, in fact, not, not too many years being back, they had done it one last time. In the book of Malachi is the last minor prophet of the Old Testament that we have. Now, I want you to imagine the internal tension this created. Some of you, you've been like in trouble before. Well, you've probably all been in various forms of trouble before. But sometimes when you're in trouble and you're waiting for the consequence to get, to get pushed out or you're, you're waiting to see what's going to happen, right? It's, there's this internal tension. Well, the, the craziest thing happened. They had historically been rebellious and rebellious and rebellious, turned against God, turned against God, turned against God. And then for hundreds of years after they were let back into the kingdom, all of a sudden God goes silent. And for hundreds of years, nothing, no prophet, no priest, no person, no one speaking with the authoritative voice and will and word of God. Now, into that context is when Christmas begins to happen. And you've got to think that the collective idea of the nation was perhaps we've gone too far. I mean, perhaps from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to to. Moses to David to Solomon to all the different kings to all the different prophets and the Isaiahs and the Ezekiels and the Jeremiahs and the, and the Nahums and the Habakkuks, which only like three of us have ever read before, right? Like to Malachi, like all of these things, all these progressions, God's not saying anything. And we're probably thinking if we're in their context, perhaps God has given up on us. Perhaps we've gone too far. Perhaps it's been pushed too much. Perhaps our rebellion has gotten us to the point where God no longer wants to do anything with us. And if God at that moment would have leaned out, he would have been absolutely justified. This is a God who's so holy, if they touched the side of a mountain, they would die, let alone continue to save and continue to pull out and continue to redeem, continue to restore. And I imagine in that moment, they thought what many of us have thought which is perhaps I've outkicked my coverage in the love of God. Perhaps I've gone too far. Perhaps I've sinned too much. Perhaps that trip I took or that season I had or that freshman year or that first job or that second marriage, perhaps I've just gone too far and outkicked the coverage of the love of God. And perhaps because of what I've done, I don't feel God anymore in my life. Perhaps because of what I've done, I feel like God doesn't even want anything to do with me. 
And into that tension-filled void, this one random night, all of a sudden, some shepherds see this thing. And they look up, and it's this host of angels singing, declaring peace on earth. Peace on earth and goodwill towards those whom his favor rests, that today a baby is born. When God should have leaned out, he did the exact opposite. He leaned in. And not just leaned in, not just sent another prophet, but said, I am coming myself. What I love about that video is at the very end, it has this baby that's kind of reaching up. And just the, I can't imagine just the dissonance between the holy God in a baby's form. Like, if you've ever held a baby, those jokers are like useless, right? Like, I don't mean like they're useless like value. I just mean useless as I'm like, they just eat and sleep and, you know, change diapers, we'll say, right? Like, that's all they do. Like, that, that was the God of the universe. That's nuts. Born into a feeding trough. That's crazy. But he did it for us, which he shouldn't have. And that's the point of this whole thing, is not to say, because we live in a context where we look back and we know God sent his son to die for us, is there is no good reason why God should have sent his son for us. We think Jesus is the reason for the season. Jesus is the reason for the season, although he's the second removed reason for the season. You want to know the real reason for the season? Our sin is the reason for the season. Because without it, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. And that's good news. That's not like you horrible person. It's, it's actually the opposite. That God's point and purpose in this whole thing was not to make us feel bad. It was to help us to realize that we are bad. And by bad, I mean we will never compare to a holy God. And because of that, he never expected us to. He did the opposite. He sent his son, Jesus, to the world. As a baby, born to die. That for the rest of eternity, we would not have to try to stand before God and say, God, was I good enough? We would stand before God knowing that I am not, but Jesus is. And when he died for me, I can have eternity reconciliation in a relationship with him. This is how John describes it. In John chapter 1, right after he says that he was full of both grace and truth. For from his fullness, the fullness of God, we have received grace upon grace. In other words, and this is what happened when the fullness of God, the glory of God, the holiness of God came to planet earth. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. In other words, Moses, Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments. Moses gave us the law that was typified there, but then further explained in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laws. Moses gave us this law, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And what if, what if what's really missing for many of us in terms of our relationship with God, in terms of our understanding of Jesus, is not just the fact that, like, okay, there's this familiarity. What if it's the fact that we have discounted his holiness and that we have over-assumed our holiness, and so there's not that much of a discrepancy. But he says, Moses said, here's the law, but Jesus said, here is me. And I am with you, I am for you, I am dying for you. And not at a moment where you deserved it, in fact the opposite, the moment where perhaps you deserved it the least, was perhaps the time that you realized it the most. I'll finish by, by telling you why I think this is important. Because I think when we get this, this changes everything. This changes everything. Jesus was talking one day. And he said this interesting statement. He said, for those who have been forgiven much, love much. 
For those who realize the depth to which they've forgiven, for those who realize the depth to which they rebelled, those who have been forgiven much, when we realize how much we've forgiven in the gulf, the incomprehensible distance between us and God, he says, for the person who has been forgiven much, they love much. And some of your testimonies say, well, I don't really have a ton to be forgiven for because I was a pretty good kid. Let me rephrase, I think, what Jesus was communicating there. We all have much to be forgiven from. And when we think maybe we don't have that much, we again over-assume who we are. The best way I can describe this is this might be a, a silly reductionist example, but it's almost like two worms are crawling. And like one worm is like a little bit quicker than the other worm, right? And they're like, look at me. I, I stepped on a Lego and I didn't even cuss. That's how good of a worm I am, you know? Like I, man, I, I pray with my family every day and we're awesome and, and that's a good thing and you should do that, right? But look at how good of a worm I am. Meanwhile, a cheetah is flying by. No cheetah is going to look at the worm and think, whew, it's a quick worm. <laughs> Can you imagine that? And I think what Jesus is communicating there is, hey, there, there's no fast worms. But the person that realizes that they are a worm, the person who realizes that they are not slow or they are not fast compared to the grandeur and the holiness of a God, that we are, we are no longer um, consider ourselves to be fast, but we are incredibly fast because we put ourselves in the back of the cheetah as it's running. I know my metaphor is getting a little bit crazy at this point. <laughs> Forgive me. But here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. We all have much to be forgiven from, just some of us realize that. And those of us who realize that, it changes everything because we become more loving because we realized how much we have been loved. And I'm telling you, when love invades your heart, when the overwhelming sense that I am wildly incompatible with God because I have so wildly rebelled against God and God in his holiness, I cannot see, I cannot touch, I cannot approach, I cannot have his presence in my life outside of the blood of Jesus. When I realize I have been forgiven that much, it puts me in a posture of awe, it puts puts me in a posture of wonder, and it makes me a more loving person. It actually just makes me more like Jesus, as it turns out. So what if the battle we fight every Christmas is actually the battle we fight every day? And what if, what if this is why remembering Jesus at the center of everything is what fundamentally shifts our lives. Because every day, if we are impacted by a God who so loved us, he gave his son to die for us, that in him, the fullness of grace and truth, that the law came from Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. I'm guessing, when you're with your family at Christmas and you're with that aunt that nobody likes, you would be more loving. Because the thing that makes us not like her is the thing that makes us see that person or that uncle or that brother or that sister or that you know, parent or that you know, whoever it is. So we look at us and we look at them and we're like, bro, I am so much faster of a worm than you are. I hope at Christmas time somebody's sitting around the dinner table opening presents and you're getting frustrated in this thought like, I'm not a cheetah. That, I hope that, I hope that like invades your mind in, a, in, a, in, a, in an annoying way but the best annoying way possible. Because I think that's what God does. He reminds us of our sinfulness, not because he wants to condemn us, but because it's in the realization of our sin that we realize how good his grace and love is. So here's the application. I want us to spend every single day from now until Christmas. And that sounds like a long time away. It's a week. Get your presents, Okay. Every day, at some point during the day, to just think about it, pray about it. Say, God, help me to see it more clearly. Help me to see the heights of your glory and the depths of my sin. And help me to see the grace that you had for me. Here's my guess. If every single one of us did that every single day from now until Christmas, every single one of us would have a different perspective going into Christmas, and we would also act differently because we would actually just be more loving.
man, I want to be a part of a church like that. I want to be a part of a group of people who holds this sense of grace and truth, holiness and sinfulness, with Jesus as the centerpiece, leaving us in awe that an unimaginable God became flesh and dwelt among us in a little feeding trough in a town in the middle of nowhere. Let's pray. God, I ask and I pray that you would help each one of us to see more clearly that because of our rebellion, because that story of the nation of Israel, who started as a family, became a nation, became enslaved, became delivered, entered into the desert, promised land. In the middle of all that, in the middle of a family becoming a nation and a promise becoming true, you were faithful, not them. And you are faithful, not us. Although we try to be and we long to be. That in our unfaithfulness, you died. In Christmas, we celebrate the beginning of that reality. That the God of the universe did an extraordinary thing in coming himself to die for us. I pray that each one of us will remember that. I pray that from now until Christmas morning, every single day, each one of us will spend, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a minute, maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's, shoot, maybe somebody's got nothing to do and they're like an hour and a half just thinking about this gospel truth of our sinfulness, your holiness, and the grace that brings us together. God, would you make us in awe? Would you help us to be in wonder? And would you help the familiarity with that not to breed contempt? But would you help the familiarity with that to breed love for you and for other people in our lives? And God, I pray that though our sin is the reason for the season, you coming to planet Earth was what made all the difference. Help us to be in awe and wonder of that. Help us to be a church that looks like you as we simply look to you, Jesus. And would you change us? Amen.